and welcome everybody here on Twitch chat and everybody on YouTube for part two of our uh, Mo Monuments of Power expansion review. This is the, the second expansion in the Call of the Mountain set. Um, this has 40 new cards. It's going to be coming out tomorrow. We just did part one of the review where we talked about all the new cards from Bilgewater and Demacia, which are two regions that are each getting 10 new cards. Uh, this one, we're going to talk about the last 20 cards. It has five regions, each get two cards, and then Targon is also getting 10 cards. So we'll talk about that. All right, let's start with Freljord, though. So Freljord has a brand new landmark, which looks awesome. So the Howling Abyss. So it's seven mana for this landmark. Round start, create in hand a random level two champion that's not in your hand or in your deck or in play. And so that means in play on, on either side. So you're not going to be creating, you know, the champions that you have in your deck. You know, it's, it's going to be just random champions from different regions. Um, this card is awesome because level two champions are the best cards in the game, right? Like champions are the best cards and having them leveled up, those are the best cards in the game. So you play this next turn, round start, you already get one level two champion. This is going to have a lot of... Um, a lot of swings to it, for sure, depending on what level two champions you are creating. Um, you know, you know, maybe you get a Fizz, maybe you get a Teemo, you know, maybe you get a Trindamir, you never know, a Karma. It could be a lot of different things here. Um, but anyway, the, this card, um, this card's just, it's just a really cool design because of that. And there's a lot of ramp with Freljord, a lot of good defense with Freljord. It's not hard at all to have seven mana. Think about how often you play in, in like a Freljord decks. Like you, you're playing Trundle and then think how easy it is to play Ice Pillar in Freljord decks. Well, this this card costs one less than Ice Pillar. It's not hard at all to, to cast this kind of card. Um, I think this this is going to be honestly. I think this is going to have a big impact on the format. I think this is going to be big in Trundle decks. I think it's going to be really good. Um, a, a lot of people think that this is just going to die immediately, and they just think, oh well, people will just kill this landmark right away. But there's a very very small amount of cards that deal with landmarks, so they like have to have one of those cards. They have to one be playing those cards, which is there's just not very many, and two they have to have one of those cards in hand and deal with this like immediately the turn you play it but you can you can kind of play it of like you know when they they tap out you play this um i don't think that i don't think that one i okay there's not very many landmarks that are that great we're going to talk about the rest of them here landmark like i don't think there's that many playable landmarks like there's a couple but so overall when you're playing games you're not going to see landmarks very often i don't think that it's it's going to be a, a card type you're going to see that often and so with that being the case, if you're not seeing landmarks that often, you're not really incentivized to play cards that are uh, that, that destroy landmarks because you're just not going to see them that often. And so therefore, I think that a card like the Howling Abyss, I think it's going to be able to stay in play uh, very easily. I think this landmark is, uh, yeah, definitely going to stay in play and it's going to be very powerful. Um so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this one. I think this is definitely a card. We're, we're probably going to play this kind of card day one. Like I think this card is going to be awesome uh, right away. And so yeah, we'll, I'm, yeah, it's just, it's going to be really fun to play. We're going to have some, some really cool games with uh, random level two champions. Now that being said, it's probably going to be really annoying to play against, right? Like playing against Trundle and Ice Pillar and all that stuff is, it's kind of annoying. And now if they just get like a bunch of random level two champions that, you know, sometimes they just like, I don't know, throw down a a really a leveled up Aurelian soul and you're just like, come on, really? <laughs> you know, like that's just going to happen. Um, yeah, so that that does mean the opponent's ch champions in play also. Yeah, so not not in play for the opponent or yourself. So just some random ones. You're, you're never going to expect like the you're going to like take an attack um like you're never gonna expect like the trundle deck that's like attacks with trundle and trundle's really big and you don't really block it because it has regeneration anyway 
And then they just throw down like a leveled up Katarina and rally and get to attack again with that big trundle and you're dead. You're just never going to expect it. But it's going to happen. Huh, Trundle Katarina. Maybe I just need to build a Trundle Katarina deck. That actually sounds pretty sweet. All right, anyway, um, let's see. Next card, eight mana, Voices of the Old Ones. Man, they want you to ramp. So eight mana is important mana cost for the different Behold cards. But also get two empty mana gems. So you get to ramp twice. So it's a double um, Catalyst of Aeons. You're getting two empty mana gems. And then for the top four cards in your deck, draw each card that costs eight plus mana, then shuffle the rest into your deck. So big payoff for playing eight plus cost cards. You know, start playing those Aurelian Souls and Infinite Mind Splitters and, you know, anything that costs eight plus mana. Um, huge, you know, being, being able to draw those cards. So this is, you know, basically like a, um, a progress day that also gets you two empty mana gems, kind of. You know, you're probably not drawing three cards, but, you know, it's it's like that, like a deep met because, you know, progress day costs eight mana. That's why I said that card. Um, but yeah, so pretty cool, pretty cool card. Um, usually the cards that, that ramp for you, like your Catalyst of Aeons, once you get to 10 mana, they're not going to be very good, right? Like, let's say, you know, like you're playing a match, a slower matchup, like you're playing like um, two, two slower decks, and you're you're the ramp deck, you're a War Mother's Call deck or whatever, and you draw Catalyst of Aeons in the late game when you already have 10, 10 mana, all it does is five mana heal your Nexus three. Like that's not a very good card, right? Like you're you're just not spending your your turn ever playing Catalyst of Aeons, and it's just a dead draw. Well, now you have a ramp card with this that even when you're in the late game and you have 10 mana gems, and that first part it doesn't do anything. Well, you can still play this card for the eight mana because you can still try to refill your hand you can go look for another war mother's call or a ruin nation or what you know whatever you need there you know you can dig a little bit with it so it's still going to be an effective card for you um, even when you have your maximum amount of mana gems so friendly Word got two very good playable cards for them um, they they both reward you for playing very slow defensive Freljord decks with a whole bunch of ramp and a whole bunch of sweepers and that kind of stuff. Not the most fun kind of deck to play against, but pretty fun to play and uh, going to be going to be even better with both of these cards. Oh, the Howling Abyss is a map in League of Legends. Cool, good to know. All right, let's check out Ionia. Ionia got two new cards. We got Trevor Snoozebottom, three mana, another support card. So that kind of just adds on to the support stuff that Lulu brought with the last expansion. So it's going to be an, a zero three support. And whenever you support, you create an attacking Mumble Sprite with my supported allies stats. Zero three for three mana. That's just going to be pretty rough to play like yeah so i'm not too excited about this now if you support you know an 8-8 then you get another 8-8 attacking so like whatever you support you get an additional of those attacking it's kind of like you can think of like zed zed's living shadow how zed's living shadow you know brings something along with it that's what the snooze bottom does but we're we're spending three mana for an o3 i i don't really expect to ever play this card to be honest uh question is Voice of the Old Ones a new addition to Zombie Anivia? Uh, speaking of no, that's our other Ionia card, Nopify. Two mana, stop a fast or slow spell that costs three or less. Um, at first I thought this cost three mana, but I guess it costs two. I don't know why at first I thought it was costing three. Um, and I was definitely less excited about it costing three. So costing two, it can at least uh, trade up on mana for you and be mana efficient if it stops something costs three or less. The thing is, there's just not that many fast or slow spells that cost three or less that are that great. There are some, you know, like there's your single combats and make it rains. And there's there's some stuff like that, but there's just not that many of them. And there's gonna be, a, you know, just a pretty big um, amount of games where the Nopify is not really doing anything for you. But you know, like it, it'll stop your Vile Feast or your Unspeakable Horror 
Um, but it doesn't stop like your burst spell. So like your your pump spells, like your troll chants and your pale cascades, it's not going to be stopping those because obviously you can't really have any counterplay to burst spells. So there's there's like slow spells that cost three or less. I don't, I don't know. There's not really many of those, um, but I don't know. Ravenous flock, I guess. Um, you know, there's not there's not a lot because um, yeah, most of the cheap spells are going to be burst. Um, yeah, Relentless Pursuit, I guess, would be there. I'm not really planning on playing Nopify in decks, but, um, you know, maybe, maybe like, your Lee Sin deck that you're trying to really protect your Lee Sin. But still, it's not, it's just not doing a whole lot for us. Zenith Blade, yeah, that, that's a, that's a pretty good one, Zenith Blade. That's the thing, so, like, you not only have to you have to have your two man available and your notify in hand when your opponent's playing this stuff. You know, like it's kind of like like that deny conundrum. If if you don't have your if you draw your deny after your opponent plays your card, or if you don't have the mana for your deny, you know it's not going to be working. But this because usually like usually like your deny type cards, you want to like late game like set it up like where you play your threat, have your deny back up, that kind of stuff, or counter like big expensive things with deny. Nopify can only counter things that cost three or less. So that's just not that impactful stuff, especially late in the game, right? Like in the late game, your opponent plays like a make it rain. Oh, well, like that's fine. They can play a make it rain, right? So it's, it's going to be good against the Demacia decks with single combat and new single combat. Not very excited about Nopify. Okay, we have a something arena, Noxcrya arena maybe it's a new landmark with uh round end so this is important so it's five mana round end so you get it the turn that you play it All right so like if your opponent like plays whatever card they tap out then it goes to your turn then you play this arena you get to have this effect before your opponent gets to um you know refill their their mana and be able to interact or anything so it's your strongest ally and the weakest enemy strike each other so it's just single combat but it's always whatever your strongest ally is and whatever your weakest enemy is. So now sometimes your strongest ally could be like a 5-1, like the 5-1 challenger. And that, you know, could die. You know, like, so this is, you don't get too much choice over this. You can, you can try to set it up as much as you, you can, but you don't get too much choice. Um, I'm not very big on this card, to be honest. Uh, there's going to be times like where you each only have one ally in play and your ally is your strongest one because it's your one and it's going to be weaker than your opponent's weakest one because it's their one they'll strike each other and they'll be bad for you this is like a, a it's a cool design and everything and, it, and it's a neat card to see but i i think practical like practicality wise i just don't think this is very practical and i'm not expecting it to have much of an impact um, the other Noxus card is pretty good, though. So, Scorched Earth, kill a damaged unit or destroy a landmark. Um, so, you know, it's just... The reason to play this is if people play landmarks, right? Because it's just... Besides the landmark part, this is much worse than Noxian Guillotine. You already have Noxian Guillotine, kills a damaged unit, and it makes a fleeting copy. That card already is not really setting the world on fire. <laughs> Speaking of Scorched Earth, it's not setting the world on fire. Um... So Scorch, So basically, we're playing a worse version of a card that doesn't see very much play at all. It sees a little bit of play. The only reason to play this is if destroying a landmark has to be very, very important to be able to play this. All right, up next we have uh, PNZ. Uh, so PNZ's got a new landmark, the University of Piltover. Best art for one of the landmarks. Get that cool Heimerdinger art. Um... This is a this is also a really cool landmark to be honest. Um, so round start, discard your hand, and then you create three random cards in hand and grant them fleeting. So this is this is the kind of card that's just an awesome awesome top end to a a, uh, a deck that's has a really low curve. So if you're thinking about like uh, maybe like a Professor Von Yip deck with all sorts of one drops, where you can empty your hand very quickly with those with those one drops. Before you play like Progress Day at the top end, this is so much better than Progress Day because your your hand's going to be empty anyway. And so instead of just drawing three cards for eight mana, 
spend five mana every single turn you're getting three new random cards in hand that is just great so like you can just have like that's really cool this is this landmark looks like a ton of fun you you need to build around this you need to play a, a deck where you play tons and tons of ones and twos but you can do that like there's different regions like like bilgewater for example bilgewater has a ton of good one and two mana cards maybe you just play like all those kind of cards and then three university of piltover and you just have this as your top end where it doesn't matter that you discard your hand because you're just going to get three new cards every single turn um it is creating them you're not drawing them from your deck it's not going to help twisted fade out um but you know it's going to be from any regions so you're gonna you know sometimes you you'll get like your your removal that you need other times you'll get some threats that you need every turn you're getting four cards you're still drawing your one card a turn so like that's that's not um being affected so you're getting four cards every turn that's pretty crazy um yeah so like so uh then you go crazy with those four cards do as much as you can and then you know next turn do that again so i i love this card i think this is an awesome landmark um i think this is a great great upgrade for pnz pnz needs some upgrades right like it's it's like a region that just in general is behind the other ones it needs some upgrades but this is this is again the kind of card that you know like scorched earth like that destroy a landmark has to be super important to play scorched earth and maybe it will be maybe you know maybe a deck built around you know university of piltover starts seeing a ton of play and then you know maybe people are playing a bunch of howling abyss you know like it's it's definitely possible we'll see some of these other landmarks like star spring um definitely possible that a lot of landmarks do see play but this one is really really cool um and i think it's going to be very strong but yeah like it, yeah but then then of course a lot of people say like jinx like yeah this definitely works with jinx of course how you discard your hand <clears throat> definitely good for leveling up jinx and then jinx will start drawing two extra cards a turn and these get you three extra cards so it's so obviously it's very good with jinx but i think it's also just good other places too like you don't have to just play jinx for this card but yeah this definitely makes jinx a better champion all right then next we got a poro bot this is a really good poro so we have our first two mana poro a two mana two three poro like that's a good body for a poro we're so used to like the one ones on poros and then you have like your poro snacks to make them two twos um or you know even your uh, professor von yips that kind of stuff like you have ways to grow one mana poros but now this is a two mana two three poro so now a um a poro snacks now you have a three four for two mana that's pretty big and all that kind of stuff but then also it says while i'm in hand it just has a random keyword and that random keyword just changes each round this is the great part about playing a digital game you can do something like this this is a real this is a really cool design here and so it's kind of like the uh plunder poro that would get the random keywords but that doesn't happen that often this one it's going to happen and you just get to see every turn you can see what your your keyword is you know maybe it's going to be elusive and you're like man i really want that elusive so i gotta play my poro bot this turn you know maybe it's Re regeneration and you're like ah, i don't really need regeneration we can wait till next turn to play the portal bot that's just really cool design and uh i like it a lot this is a good good update for the poro decks both of these cards are awesome in poro decks you want to make a pnz for your poro deck because you can unload a whole bunch of poros really fast have this for a great top end card to be able to keep refilling your hand and still drawing towards your poros and stuff like that so there we go so i, I think <clears throat> So last thing with University of Piltover, um, you know, besides your regular Jinx deck with a bunch of PNZ cards, I think this could just be a great splash, like I talked about, in different regions that have a lot of good uh, cards that cost one and two mana. So kind of looking for that, looking for different regions that you have a lot of one and two mana cards that are, you know, fairly effective that you can play very quickly and uh, unload your hand, play that with University of Piltover as a top end piece. That could be very effective. All right, uh, Shadow Isles also gets a landmark, Vault of Helia. Um, five mana landmark, round start, kill your most expensive ally to summon an ally from your deck that costs one more. So we were discussing it and pretty sure that you have to have the ally in your deck that costs one more for this to happen, right? Like, so pretty sure that like if your, your curve ends at Rekindler and you have a Rekindler in play, it's not going to just kill your rekindler to look for an eight mana card that you don't have any eight mana cards 
and then just kills your rekindler and that's it pretty sure you know like it will check your deck see do you have an eight drop nope then it will not kill your rekindler so then it will do nothing at that that point um <laughs> university of porotover instead of piltover porotover i like it um yeah so this is so you say like un great with undying i mean so like let's say the undying is your most expensive ally when you play this it kills your it kills your undying and puts a four mana thing that you have in your deck into play but then it's just going to kill your four mana thing to put something that costs five if you have that, it's not going to then just go and kill your, keep killing your the undying. I think this is the kind of card that's going to not play as well as it looks. Like for spending five mana, I think that at that point, like you, you'd rather just have like another unit or another spell that affects the board. I don't know. I, I think this is going to be the kind of card that's not going to, um, that's going to be underwhelming, a lot of times. Think of like the times that you're in like a later game and your most expensive unit is your Undying that costs three, but you don't have anything that costs four because you, you've you already played a couple of things that cost four, you drew another one, you know, you know you've drawn a couple of things that cost four, like that kind of stuff. And they've gotten rid of uh, those. It's a later game. You have like 15 cards left in your deck. None of them are allies that cost four mana. So it's just not going to do anything at that point. No, so no, it does not count itself. No, so the landmark does not count as an ally. Landmarks aren't allies. They are just, they're just landmarks. So no, you can't have, the Vaults of Helia will not destroy itself. It will not, because it's not an ally. Um, Rasa is a playability. So you can't, like it, it works with Rasa in the fact that you're going to have something die, but it can't just put Rasa into play and then it does stuff because Rasa is a playability, not a summon. So if you do build around this, you de you definitely need to focus on things that summon, or that they have summon abilities. Yeah, very under underwhelmed by this. Honestly, I think it. Again, I think it, it looks it looks like it could be really cool, but I don't think the fact that it always basically the fact that you don't get to choose that you always kill your most expensive ally and you always get like I think that that's going to be the problem here with this card. Um, I think it would be it would be better if it act, actually it would be better if it just killed your least expensive ally where you could kind of build around it more where you can have your one and two drops that are that you want to die which there's a lot of those you know like your warden's prey your curse keepers and you can you know have your warden's prey die to, to bring out a two drop have your curse keeper dry, die bring out a three drop I think you know like or maybe if you could choose you know like you know round start pick an ally to to die, you know kill an ally of your choice and you know, it's that kind of stuff. It's just, I don't think this is going to play very well. All right, then next we have Crumble for five mana. Another way to destroy a landmark. So now Shadow Isles has one. Um, you know, kill your own ally to kill a unit or destroy a landmark. This could be a pretty decent card. So this is, you know, Vengeance that costs two less, that also gets to destroy a landmark. But you have to kill your own ally. And there's a lot of times where killing your own ally in Shadow Isles is really not much of a downside. And it can be an upside, even. Um, so I think that having having access to a permanent removal spell that can take down Trundle, you know, take down Leviathan, take down anything you want at only five mana with spell mana, like that's per that's pretty awesome. I think this is gonna be a, a big player. And so this does does uh, kind of lead you towards wanting to play Shadow Isles to be able to have a nice, efficient card to be able to destroy landmarks. Right, so th you said this one costs five, all the others cost three to destroy landmarks. But the thing is, is this, this also kills any unit. This kills Trundle. Like, this kills champions, right? Like, this, this kills, um, you know, whatever you want it to, which that's awesome. You know, like, so usually you need, like, Vengeance to be able to kill any unit that costs seven mana for fast. This is five mana slow to kill a unit, you know, but then it could also destroy a landmark and you do have to kill your own thing. Yes, Spell Shield will stop this. Yes, Spell Shield stops everything. Bastion now is four mana. Um, but Spell Shield will just stop this. Like, you, you will not kill your own ally, right? Like, if this, this would get Spell Shielded, but then... Because you, you have to kill your ally to kill a unit, but then it would just, Spell Shield would just stop the spell, it would just fizzle it. 
yes, this is like Noxian Fervor that if they kill your own outlay, if they kill your unit that you're targeting in response, it will fizzle the spell. So yeah, it's like it's like a slow speed Noxian Fervor in that respect, yes. So it's kind of like, yeah, like a slow speed Noxian Fervor, a slow speed, it's, you can kind of think of it like slow speed single combat where your unit has like death touch where it's gonna like it it automatically kills the other unit whenever they strike each other like like both unit like so it's slow speed single combat for five mana where both things always die there you go so that's that's what it is which that's that's definitely useful where you can have your cursed keeper take down trundle for five mana like that's pretty nice but of course the slow speed is that's gonna be uh, it's gonna be risky. I think that's for this for this region, you know, with uh, Shadow Isles. I think that's good. I think that's that stuff. I think that's good. I think that's better than single combat would be in in this region. All right, and finally we're over to Targon. Targon's got ten new cards and a new champion. So we'll start with that. We start with Soraka, uh, three mana one six uh, that has a support ability, and whenever you support with Soraka, you heal both it and its supported ally four, which that can be very useful for some of those bilge water cards that we that we uh, saw earlier with that self damage. And then it levels up once you've healed uh, any damaged allies four plus times. So when you play Soraka, like let's say you have the attack token on turn three and you play Soraka on turn three and attack with Soraka on turn three, Soraka will not be damaged at that point. So even though it says heal me uh, four, you're not it's not going to be a damaged ally so it's not going to help itself level up so you'd have to have another damaged ally already in play on turn one or turn two which is not easy to do but those two new bilgewater cards could help you do that uh in order for uh you to even start this level up process with attacking with soraka it only has one power for three mana so it's it's really not striking for much at, at all and so like whenever you're looking at it from the other side you don't need to just block Soraka with your three two, because your you know your three two will take the one damage. But then you know that like whenever if Sor if you're not going to be able to kill Soraka, Soraka will be able to attack and just heal itself four and just heal it. So you can just take like the one damage from Soraka, and not let it uh, deal the damage to you, or not let it uh, take any damage. So not let it uh, heal itself and go towards the level up with that. All right, so let's see what Soraka does when it levels up. So it's not going to be super easy to he to heal. Uh, well, okay. So one, it doesn't say that Soraka needs to see you heal for uh, damage allies four plus times. So that does mean that even though Soraka only costs three mana, it's going to be kind of similar to Ezreal that costs three mana, where later on in the game you can play it and have it be leveled up and have it be pretty nice. Uh, you know, similar to like Ezreal in that respect. You can play a game, heal four damage allies four plus time throughout the game play a soraka in the late game and it will be leveled up because that's going to be important because leveled up soraka looks pretty nice because then the first time you heal a damage damaged ally each round you draw a card so it can really help you draw a lot of cards so that that could be every single turn drawing cards because it's not that difficult to heal um damaged allies especially in targon um, with some of these other cards we've seen like guiding touch and so on um and then uh let's see so we have so it still has the support instead of just healing four it just fully heals so you know fully heal you you know both it and the supported ally so yeah this does work great with tom kench right like because tom kench we talked about like how tom kench needs to be uh healed um and also tom kench has like those bilge those uh cheaper bilge water cards that automatically do damage themselves so that gives you targets for soraka to heal so yeah, Soraka and Tom Kench definitely work really well together. Looks like Soraka's uh, champion spell is going to be Soraka's Wish. And that's three mana slow speed where you fully heal every single damaged ally that you have in play. So yeah, pretty decent for a champion spell. I don't think that that's really that great of a card to play on its own. But I think that's a good champion spell where there will be there will be times in games where that will be really useful and you're going to want to play a wish um, and, you know, like it will it will do a lot for you. But it's not necessarily something that I, I like. I don't think that's necessarily a great individual card to, to have 
but that's a really good champion spell like that's i think they do a good job in this game with that of like the, these champion spells um are kind of situational like that for the most part you know obviously there's there's exceptions either way but there's a lot of times where like your champion spells aren't cards that you're putting in your deck but they're still nice to have access to so yeah so basically so you're going to want to be healing your allies a lot and so we'll we'll be talking more about healing allies with, with some of these other cards uh, for Soraka, but it, that does seem to pair great with Tom Kench. As we talked about how, like, Tom Kench with the acquired taste deals damage to itself whenever it's eating, so you're going to want to be able to heal Tom Kench. And then, of course, they have these kind of cards like uh, Fortune, Croaker, Boxtopus, Krusty Codger. These are all things that are great to heal, Lounging Lizard. So they're, you know, kind of building this deck for you. But looks pretty good. Um, new landmark, in, which is epic for Targon, is going to be Star Spring. So that's a landmark that says round end, you heal damage allies one. Then once I've seen you heal 22 plus damage from allies, you win the game. Honestly, this card looks pretty strong. For it only costs two mana, so it really doesn't have much of a much of a you know cost to it. You're only spending two mana to get this thing out here. And then it's also a round end. So it's really easy to have your opponent spend their mana and then play a Star Spring where you don't have to worry about it dying right away. But e even even so, like it's hard to kill, it's going to be hard to kill landmarks. Um, but so round end immediately, you heal every single one of your damaged allies one. It's not just like, it's not just a damaged ally you heal one, all of your damaged allies heal one. So if you have four damaged allies, You'll heal them all one at the round end, and so you're, that's already healing for four. Um, so that's you know that's pretty awesome. And then you only have to heal twenty two plus damage. Um, I'm not sure exactly where that that number comes from, but um, you know that's more than your general nexus health. <clears throat> it doesn't seem like that much, honestly, when you're talking about Soraka being able to fully heal. And a lot of these other cards, um, you know, with with a lot of, of healthier healing, it does twenty two doesn't seem like that difficult of an ask. Whenever you have a payoff that's as strong as win the game, there's there's nothing that's more valuable in a game than win the game. <laughs> that's the most valuable thing you can possibly have. Um, so the, yeah, this this looks like a pretty good landmark. So as we were talking about with these. Um, you know, destroying landmarks have to be very, very, uh, valuable to be able to do that for Scorched Earth. And I think that it will be, because I think we have three really good landmarks, the Howling Abyss, um, this University of Piltover, which I think people are going to be sleeping on right away, but I think that's going to be a very good landmark. And then Star Spring. So I think we have three good landmarks. I think there's six total. looks like three, three are going to be pretty playable. The other three, maybe not so much. I don't, I don't think that just because landmarks die to removal means that you don't play land, landmarks. Like somebody said here, I feel like running landmarks outside of Ionia is going to be impossible. How do you protect them? You don't necessarily have to protect them. You just get, even if, like, let's say you play your Star Spring and then your opponent crumbles it. You're still trading one for, like, uh, crumbles not, let's, let's use this one, Scorched Earth. They play Scorched Earth to destroy it. You're still trading one for one like you you play something they played something to remove it you know just because you have units that die you know like you play soraka and then they play culling strike and kill soraka that doesn't mean you don't play soraka because they can just use a removal spell and remove it the onus is on the opponent to do something about your star spring because if they don't do anything and you you are just threatening to win the game so you're going to play cards that that threaten to win the game there's no there's no way that they're going to, like, you play Star Spring and they get, like, an upper, like, the upper hand on you, on destroying the Star Spring, right? Like, there's not, like, destroy a landmark plus draw a card. Like, that's not a thing. Right? Like, there's not going to be, like, where they get extra value from destroying your landmark. So I don't think there's, the, there's too much downside into playing them. Yes, regeneration does count as healing as well. So if you're playing this with, like, Trundle and Trundle regenerates... Or, you know, just whatever card you want with regenerates. 
that does count as healing. So however much however much uh, damage you regenerate, that does go towards the Star Spring. Absolutely. So yeah, 22 to heal does seem fairly easy for something that valuable. I'm su I'm surprised it's that low, to be honest. When we're talking about you know like healing four with Soraka with both it and its supported ally, where effectively if if it would actually heal four on both of them, it could potentially heal eight. And that's over a third of the way to just winning the game. It doesn't seem like that much. All right, up next, we have our seven mana, seven, five, a new dragon for Targon, the Eclipse Dragon with Fury that has both Daybreak and Nightfall. Daybreak, the next dragon or celestial unit that you play costs two less. That's just that's awesome. And then Nightfall, create a random dragon follower and celestial follower in hand. That's even more awesome. So with Nightfall, you're looking at a 7 mana, 7-5 seven with Nightfall that's effectively a draw too. You're drawing a dragon and a celestial. Um, drawing two cards usually costs a lot of mana, right? Like Deep Meditation costs... Uh, <clears throat> cost five mana to draw two. Um, there's a lot of different things that cost like four mana to draw two. Um, this is drawing two, and it's also uh, being a seven five fury for seven. But then also one of those cards you're getting is a celestial. Now you, the celestial is going to be random, so it's not like your other invoke cards where you can really have more choice over your celestial. But celestials are very valuable. And we see like the cards that do create celestials, like your um, your different, uh, like the three mana two one with nightfall or the three mana one two with nightfall, those different cards. Like, you don't usually play two ones for three or one twos for three, but you do play those because they create your celestials because that's how valuable invoking is. So, this card seems really good. I think this could be played, you know, you can play this with dragons if you want. You can play this in just like a nightfall deck, in like a Diana deck. Um, this could just be good with, with Diana as just like a top end for your Nightfall that's going to be giving you some extra stuff. Um, but then also this could be good in just a Leona deck. Like if you have um, the uh, Rasa, not Rasa, um, you have the five mana card that says it's always uh, day for you. You can play this as your second card and you can turn on both your Daybreak and your Nightfall. Um, if you want to go for it. So this seems like this is a pretty good top end card for multiple decks. I like it. It's not like perfect because like we're still talking about a seven mana seven five. So it's not like going to be everywhere, you know, like where everybody's playing this no matter what. But I think this is just a, a really cool card that can kind of fit in a dragon deck, could fit in a daybreak deck, could fit in a nightfall deck. Um, you know, you can just kind of play this a little bit everywhere. And I think that's a really well designed card. All right, then we have Stargazer, four mana, three, four. Whenever you heal a damaged ally, give it elusive this round. So that's definitely going to be important with Soraka because Soraka is attacking in as a one six, which is not strong at all. And so even we talked about how you don't have to block Soraka earlier, but also Soraka is very easy to block. You can You get to make the decision as the defending player you know which way you want to go stargazer uh does have like you know soraka even at full health i no because it's a damaged ally okay so if if soraka is not at full health and it attacks it heals itself maybe the other thing it is damage it's attacking it's healing that you get to give those elusive those are going to be much more difficult to block so it gives soraka decks ways to ways to win the game because when you're playing cards like Soraka and you're just healing all the time, it's kind of difficult to end games because all you're doing is healing, like you're playing all defense. So that's that's why like you have a landmark like the Star Spring because that's like something that can actually just end the game for you when you're just only doing healing. And Stargazer is just another option there. So that gives you another way with the Elusive to be able to get an easier way to get damage across and uh, end the game. So that's those are important cards to print, or just cards like those are important and are important to print. Because if you're thinking about uh, like those kind of Soraka decks, they're just you know a Soraka mirror match where you're both just sitting back healing. 
you're probably you know when you're designing those kind of cards you're thinking okay well how are these games going to end we don't want people just to be at uh 20 and 20 as far as life for you know 20 turns how are we actually going to get these games to end and so stargazer has that potential of healing a lot of damaged allies every round giving them all elusive every round and um you know ending games like that to go along with star spring sneaky zebels which is like cool card cool art all that kind of stuff five mana three three it has elusive and whenever you play it you stun all enemies with two or less power really cool card i think this is just on par with it's you know right on par with the five mana elusives from bilgewater um with the abyssal eye and um uh, the other one, the 4-4 with the tune. So it's not as big as the 4-4 with the tune, but you know it has that that stun ability that can maybe help you alpha attack or at least you know stun maybe more elusives. Um, yeah, you know, so this is probably going in. This is probably not something you're playing in like a normal Targon deck. You're probably playing this in like a an elusive deck or a deck that's using a lot of buff. You know, maybe you play this with Freljord, um, like a. Uh, Freljord Targon uh, spell heavy deck with the 2 3 that's buffing things, and you can buff this sneaky Zebels and get in a bunch of elusive damage. That's an option. Um, you know, so this isn't going to see a ton of play, but it, it will see some and it will surprise some people. I think that's that's kind of what this is going to be. This, this will surprise some people how uh, effective and efficient sneaky Zebels is. Good card, just like the other five mana elusives in Bilgewater. All right, we got Crystal Ibex, four mana, four, four. Whenever you play it, grant an ally Overwhelm. So that's kind of cool. So thinking about this with like, um, uh, with like the dragons, like where, where the dragons have a lot of power and they're usually pretty big. So giving them Overwhelm could be really nice, um, especially like the new um seven seven mana six six fury dragon the stalking brood mother this could be really cool to be able to give overwhelm um or even something like shivana um yeah so maybe if, if we're playing like a a targon demacia dragon deck with shivana you know giving these things uh overwhelm could be really cool you know this scout um, attacking multiple times they grow with fury so that's where i kind of see this the thing is, is like, it costs four for a four, four. There's already a four mana, four, four dragon. So you're playing this over that. So you're playing this over that. And, um, and then it's also in the same mana slot as Shivana. Like you don't want to play a whole bunch of four mana units in a deck. Usually like you can maybe have like two, if this had a creature type dragon also, this would be much, you know, now we're really talking but the fact that it doesn't have creature type dragon i don't know um four mana four four is not bad though and we've seen like, like seen four mana four four not necessarily mean autoplay because you know like we've had that with like the sea monster before was the four mana four four um but it's it's certainly you could do worse you know it's something that you you know don't have to really worry about so maybe a good combo card um, but you know, pretty decent. Yeah, that's true. You could you play with Star Shepherd in like a healing deck where Star Shepherd, yeah, like in if you're playing like the, this kind of healing deck and Star Shepherd's getting really big, try to give it to Star Shepherd. I'm not sure if that's if that's going to be more effective than just like you know having Stargazer in that four mana slot and trying to give your Star Shepherd elusive. Maybe I don't know, but you're probably not playing both of those all right up next astral protection four mana burst you heal an ally four and grant it plus zero plus four um obviously this is you know, just something to go with like a, a soraka deck for sure um just a pretty good spell you know it, it doesn't bump up uh bump up the power at all like a card like fury of the north does so you don't get to really help win combat with this this just helps keep your thing alive it's not like you know, like, there's a lot of times like your opponent will play a pump spell and then you play a pump spell like a Fury of the North that you try to like re-up their pump spell. 
this is just going to be like they play a pump spell and then you play your protection keep your thing alive but it's a good heal your ally for that grant is a permanent plus zero plus four so then whenever your thing takes damage you are going to be able to heal it more so this this really help helps enable both soraka and starspring for having your um, ally be uh, healed a certain amount but then also that plus zero plus four does mean that you get to heal even more with these things so it's a, it's a nice little support card you know and you're going to need you're going to need your support cards with that nice enabler uh, for these so enables your other cards to be better so there we go all right we talked about wish um spring guardian uh spring guardian is three mana three three when i'm summoned to create spring gifts in hand um so a three mana three three with a way to just generate a card very playable like three mana three three that's those are good stats lots of playable three mana three threes and it automatically creates another card for you in hand very good spring gifts just one mana fully heal an ally uh, very useful at different times and and uh, certainly um, with your uh, star spring that you're trying to win the game with so this is a very good card um, definitely going to be in any soraka deck and uh, yeah, yeah just can do a lot there so um yeah, pretty good. Just three mana, three three. That that will be playable, and and not only Soraka decks. You'll be able to find different places for this in different Targon decks. Right now with Targon, there's not very good three mana cards. Like there's the as far as non champions go, um, you know, you're you're basically looking at like the 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 three mana one one with support, um, the Mentor of the Stones. That's kind of like what you're playing at the three mana slot. But there's a lot of times where Mentor of the Stones um, is is really like uh, kind of bland and it's really easy to kill and like in this format with a lot of make it rains you don't always want to be playing men to the stones this this just gives you another good option um, as just a, a nice uh, beefy creature yeah there's both priestesses but then those you know those are also really small so when you're looking at like priestesses and mentor the stones they're all really small for three mana so if you want something that's actually like a pretty good body at three mana this gives you an option Right, because, yeah, like, that's the thing about the, the three-mana slot with Targon is there wasn't decent-sized bodies. All right, then finally, we have another way to get rid of a landmark with Divergent Paths. Draw a landmark or destroy a landmark. This one's going to be really, really important to play with Starspring. I think that this is anybody who's playing Starspring should be playing this card because Starspring is just such, such a valuable card and a card that you're completely building around that you should have a three mana draw it because then it also has the destroy there i think that i think that this this gives you a big reason to want to play targon when you're playing star spring or whenever you're playing university of piltover or playing howling abyss if you're playing the those those um awesome really build around uh landmarks you really want to play targon because you can uh use those to find your landmark but then you also have an efficient answer to destroy it now again just because you have removal here for these landmarks doesn't mean that that you shouldn't play landmarks okay just because divergent paths exist and score shirts exist and stuff like that doesn't mean that you should not play your seven mana um landmark because um, you can find you can find spots to be able to play this and again it's a round start if you can you know wait till they don't have like the three mana or maybe you throw it out there kind of early maybe they don't have it yet you're already going to be creating your random level two champions i think you still play these just because there's removal doesn't mean you don't play them but those three landmarks in particular are the ones that i'm excited about the most um and uh targon just seems like a really good region to be in you have a lot of healing in targon so you don't die to burn right away you have great late game with celestials and now great late game with star star spring and then you also have good interaction you have cards like bastion divergent paths you have good good card draw you have pale cascade targon just seems like a very solid region to to be like a support region to whatever kind of archetype you are building all right but there we go that's uh part two for our uh, Monuments of Power 
expansion review. Those of y'all watching later on YouTube, uh, please hit that like button, leave those comments about anything, uh, any of these cards that you know I have been underrating, I'm overrating, anything like that, let me know. But more importantly, let me know what kind of decks do you want to see me build over the next week or two uh, with this new set. What kind of, you know, Soraka with what champions? Obviously Soraka, Tom Kench, is an, is an obvious one what you know what else do you want to see Soraka with Vladimir anything you know anything else um any of these new champs any of these new cards um yeah where do you want to see them what do you want to see me build give me those ideas and I'll make it happen all right but anyway thank you so much for watching part two here and I'll see you for the next video